Greetings, Langarinos. Uh, it is Peter. And I'm Tyler. Uh, and we are here today to embark on a new language project. So one of the things um, that you might know if you're a polyglot is that there are seven, a little over 7,000 languages in the world, and the vast majority of them are little described or undescribed. So a polyglot often reaches a point in their study of languages where they start getting interested in languages which do not have a lot of descriptive materials. Of course, it's a very fun challenge. What's a polyglot anyway? Well, polyglot, um, I will resist giving some sort of technical definition. It's somebody who studies a lot of languages. That's probably the easiest way to, usually we mean speaks a bunch of languages, but then we have to define what does it mean to know a language and it's yeah. not that easy. So we can simply say somebody who studies a lot of languages. Um, typically the more polyglot someone is, the more unrelated languages they study also. So you can study a lot of very closely related languages, but when you start meeting uh, the polyglots who speak more than 12 languages, often they will speak very unrelated languages like Chinese and Turkish and Swahili, uh, and it gets pretty impressive. And part of the reason is oftentimes people who love language, like Tyler and I do, get incredibly curious about language. And so you're bound to start studying languages which have less and less materials. Now, this is the case we are at now. We are going to look at a small sample text from a language called Ranonga from Solomon Islands. Um, we are going to look at a traditional story that they have written down and the language community, they. And for one line in Ganonga, they will have one line in English. And so it's up to us to figure out what each word means. And this is exactly the kind of puzzle a polyglot loves. So that's I'm right. going to let, go ahead. let me just inter interject there. Uh, a lot of people, I think, have the impression that all linguists do is translate. It's, once you have a text translated, that's it. Work is done. There's nothing else to talk about. We want to show you that that's not the case. That, that's where the work really begins. We have a text in two languages. It's called a bilingual. And we're going to show what you can get out of that. All right. So the first thing we're doing is looking at the text here. If you're watching the screen, you can see it's on the left. We've got some text in Ganonga. And the very next tech page, there'll be a line for line translation. So the first thing we're gonna do is write down them line for line and write the translation underneath them. And then we will open a program called Flex. Once we get to a certain uh, understanding of how we want to write it and everything like that, we'll open Flex and then we will start copying and pasting some of our lines in there. So first of all, we're very lucky that it's, or it's very convenient for us that it's already there in Roman characters, a system that we know well. Many languages, if they're written at all, will be written in other systems. It's very helpful. Um, one thing to note is that uh, Melanesia, where Solomon Islands is located, is the most linguistically diverse place in the world. And they speak Creoles in the three major countries, which are Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu. They speak Creoles based on English. So um, English in Solomon Islands being a former British protectorate, English was the language they used for communication with outsiders and the language they used for translations. So this is very, very set up for a polyglot who speaks English as a first language. You want to give us a quick, gets... quick look at the map for those who don't know? Um, yeah, let's see if we can look at the map right quick. So we'll, I'll make this full screen. We'll look at the entire map. Oop. Just so people can know where on the globe we're dealing with. Give us, we don't need roads. So there's the United States. We go left, west. There's <laughs> Hawaii. Like <laughs> so as if you look at the screen, you can see Australia is kind of at the bottom left. We're going northeast of Australia. And as we zoom in, it's mm. Solomon Sea, now Solomon Islands. So we are particularly looking at an area over here. Perfect. Thank you. So there is Gizo, and you can see Ranonga from Gizo. Do you see the name now, Ranonga Island? Ooh, yes. One of the languages spoken on Ranonga is Ganonga. And that is the language we'll be looking at today. If we zoom out a little bit, you can see that's the Solomon Islands right there. And again, there's Australia. Melanesia then is Papua New Guinea, which is the eastern half of the island of New Guinea, and these islands, and all the way up to Bougainville, and then you get Solomon Islands through there, and then there's Vanuatu. 
And you can see right. south of that is New Caledonia. Let's get back to the text then. Let's get back to the exciting part, which is the text. So we've run into our first challenge. <laughs> um, we've written a couple lines and we get to a line that says, Yeah, show us where. Um, was, uh, right there, for... it says, Amai za omanga. Now, I know about oceanic languages and about how these became written, came to be written languages. And so I know that this underlined N is typically used for a velar nasal. Yeah, maybe if you could unhighlight it, it'd be a little clearer to see. Yeah. The sound that is typically found in the English word singer, the mm right. sound in singer. So we have kind of a couple options how to deal with this. Doing an N with an underline will be our least easily applied option. We can write it as an NG mm -hmm. and there shouldn't be a conflict. We can also use um, an IPA picker, such as, oh, I gotta make this full screen so I can accept it. it has nothing, nothing to do with AL, that's the International Phonetic Alphabet. That's right. About. So you can find it from I2Speak. You can also find any yep. character yeah. you need. I can't see what I'm typing. You can find any character you need from Wikipedia, so it will give you options as well. So there, that's and you can... It's the NG and sing and singer. That's the sound symbol that we want. Yep, that's the one we want right there. So you and can get it from any source. And if you are using a Microsoft Word document, um, you can select it in the special characters and then create a shortcut key which is what most linguists do. It's what I did when I was writing my dissertation. For example, every special character that is in the language I worked on, I had hotkeys for it in a Word doc. So, so if we, we choose to use the velar nasal here, then we would just need one special character. So from this page, that seems to be the only special writing, the only special spelling is the underlined N. We've decided we've opted to go with the Engma character. It's easy enough if we change our minds later to do a find and replace op operation too, depending what we're doing. There are also two characters on here that must be representing kind of morphological things. Um, one is here we've written Lea E. Ah, with a dash. I'm just about to write it. Yeah, I just wrote it here. Lea right. dash E. So I'm guessing this dash is used for a suffix or an end click. Maybe. We couldn't know yet. Could it be a glottal stop that's being represented? Um, I'm going to make an educated guess and say no. But it could, I mean, when they don't tell you what the symbol is, it could be anything. This is an oceanic language, and I spe specialize in oceanic languages. But for anybody out there who thinks that gives me some sort of giant advantage here, there are 450 oceanic languages. The Indo-European language family has about 250 languages. So... There's well, quite a bit of diversity within Oceanic. Um, I can't know for sure, but for now, I'm assuming that it's representing a suffix. Um, and if I find other information later that contradicts that, I will revise <laughs> my hypothesis. The next thing we're really looking at here is this kind of tick mark that comes between Z and Omanga. Now, when I look up here above this and I see Azai Za Omanga, and then I see Naza Zomanga, I start having a guess what Zomanga means and what's going on here. What do you think, Tyler? Well, it's it's an interesting puzzle. We can from the the one in line four, it's clear you can have that sequences of vowels, at least in the right. You can have a za followed mm -hmm. by omanga. And that makes me think that the z apostrophe might be something else. Or it's optional contraction like we do with English let us versus let's. So and I would want knowing wanna... knowing that their writing system is based on English, you start to get an extra hint because we know that English is the language of translation. This is the language that the people learned to read and write in uh, before they applied writing to their own language. So, so I'm cool. going to guess that Z tick mark omanga means the same thing as za omanga, and it's a contraction. It's also noteworthy that right before the Z apostrophe, you've got Naza, which may also incorporate this za, whatever it is. Of course, I know nothing about the language or the family. I'm just coming at it completely as an outsider. One, a couple Thanks, words before that, you get naza za omanga. Okay. I think I'm inclining to the view that z apostrophe is just an optional contraction for za. We've got down here again with 
knee. N and knee. apostrophe. Knee, honey. So I've got reduplication happening. Ili gani gani. And then later on in the same sentence, paragraph two, paro paro. And this reduplication is interesting. Now, reduplication is when the word is done twice. So in English, the best example of reduplication is the difference between like and like like. I don't know. When I was in elementary school, there's a big difference. Do you like them or do you like like them? I don't know if that still exists today, but just to say when you say a word twice and it, it can change the meaning or aspect or something. Right. right. What we see Wait here to, is ili gani uh -huh. and gani is done twice on the end. So ili gani and then another gani added on the end. I'll rule this word paro paro go. It looks like the first part is repeated, the paro. And paro go is the root. So we've just guessing, which we don't know much about this language yet. Right, right. Looks like they have reduplication both to the left and to the right. One may be productive and one may be fossilized is my guess, but who knows? So do you want to take a few lines, input them, and work on the analysis? Start working on analysis. We'll yeah, that. let's do that. So we got to start adding a translation under each line as uh, well. Let's not. Let's not do it here. Let's first copy what you've got there, input it into Flex, then add the translation to that. Because we're going to just go into the baseline, first of all. Yeah, so I'm going to in the baseline in flex. Um, I'm in the wrong. Yeah, okay. just start a new start a new doc. I think, oh, you wanted you wanted to have a new file. So this is the right flex. file. I just have the wrong text pasted in there. So by the way, we should mention this flex program, Fieldworks Language Explorer, is available for free to download, and it's a great tool if you're if analyzing languages is the vibe. <laughs> give, flex give is low key goaded. Yeah, if yeah. analyzing language undescribed yeah. languages or little described languages is the vibe very good i've used it for many years in my work on a couple other languages so yeah. do you, are we okay you can put the title up above yeah, and this is just text one. right call it, yeah call it where it starts so that's plenty let's input the title so the title is in there and then the english title is we can go ahead and input that to the story of the clam story of the clam all right, so when we go to the analyst, so right now I'm in the baseline in Flex and I'm in the, there's kind of like a menu on the left and I'm in the texts and words section. A lot of menus there on the left, yes. Um, I'm in the text and words section and there I'm in the baseline. Baseline is where you enter in the language data. When you go over to the analyze tab, this is where you can start in adding free translations and analyzing each word in isolation. That's right. So. Um, Let's go ahead and start adding some free translations. First one is there was a giant. All right, this is page two of our same doc. I yeah. can read that aloud for us if you wanna. Okay, I'm gonna add them in here. So kole nanamaka iliganigani is there was a giant or is a giant? There was, there was. All right, our second line, Beto Kolandia. And there were three youths, youths. Oyster voiceless, youth, youths. And there were three youths. Do you want to do a few more sentences? What we've got, let's get all the translations. Yeah, it's maybe most interesting for people seeing this to know what we're actually dealing with. One day, the three brothers went out to look for crabs. All right. Then. So when they'd been out, they came back to cook them. When they'd been out, they came back to cook them over an open fire. All right. Last sentence and here. If, if it turns out we're misaligned, it's easy. It's relatively easy to fix this, by the way. Don't worry too much. And so it smelled good to the giant. So giant is mentioned twice. You might already know which word it is, but let me take a look to find the word for giant. Up above where you have the analyze tab selected, can you click gloss next to it? This omits a bunch of the details and we can see more at a time. So I know the I'm thinking 1.1 has a word for giant and that the last one has a word for giant. And I think it's that very last word, iliganihani. It feels gigantic to me. It is a big word. Um, and I can 
tell you some insider information from Proto-Oceanic. The Proto-Oceanic word for eat was kani, K-A-N-I. Um, oh, like kai kai. Like kai kai kai. Kani, okay, I include an N in there, Portuguese But it depends style. on where you're getting kai from. Kai could also be in Western yeah, yeah, Austronesian. For sure. But a lot of times the ones we get from English come from Polynesian languages where the N... I don't know what condition N deleting in some words between A and I, but it happens more N and L deleted in those positions more not than once, but not everywhere. So, right. So, uh, if you could click under that Iligani Gani in line one, and in the word gloss, just put, just type in giant. I think it'll recognize it then when it occurs later. They click the green check mark in the bottom, right? See there. This is a cool thing about Flex. We've entered it there in one one and down in one five. The program knows same word, and that pale greenish color shows that it's the guess. Now yeah, you can have nice. different words spelled alike, so it's not going to be certain. If you click the left green check with the plus, that says approve all. Yeah. However, when we go to our analyze tab, I can do more details. Yeah. So, we can so what, break it down, right? What we would have wanted to do is create an entry. So when we go to our lexicon. Our lexicon is empty, even though we've already is, solved one word. Let's say a word or two about what a lexicon is. And this is another strength of the flex. So the lexicon, it is a, you know, you might think that some things are theoretical linguistics and some things aren't, but pretty much everything is theoretical. The notion of a word is theoretical. That a word exists is theoretical. You might, dear listener, think that it's obvious because there's a space between them, but a quick look at the writing systems of the world we'll realize not all of them put spaces between words um, and a word is a, definitely a theoretical construct so is the notion of a lexicon meaning uh like a dictionary basically yeah like a dictionary in your mind so this list of like, words this lexicon is on a computer and we're going to enter in the words that are important now what we've done in text and words is we've gone to the glossing tab and we've suggested a gloss because you know maybe tentatively we don't want to add a new entry and we go over to the analyze club clause and we go to lexical entries we can create a new entry that's right iligani gani we've, it's going to suggest what we've already input which which we like and we want that right. so we're basically we're, just going to create it we're gonna, we don't we're gonna know reason that there are nouns, but we don't know what's that we're going to reason that this language has nouns seems pretty solid yeah now one of the categories that you can analyze is noun or verb, and it doesn't really matter if you do it or not. It depends on what, what you expect the language to be like, but we expect there to be nouns and verbs in the language. For now, though, we could leave it unanalyzed, or we could guess that it's a noun. Let's, let's look for repeated words. What's that? Yeah. I would say let's, let's look for repeated words in the text to make some more guesses. I'm going to leave it as... Oh, and you I... can customize this uh, the categories. I didn't realize that at first, after many years of using it. I'm going to leave it as not sure for now. Secret though, secretary, not sure. Though we do think that it is a noun. Let's say I go into my dictionary. Now I have Iligani Gani in my lexicon. And I'm in lexicon edit. So if I go to grammatical info, I can change this to noun. That's right. If I decide that it's a noun later. Or I'll leave it as a noun for now. And I could go back and change it to not sure later if I change my mind. So here we start to see what there is to do beyond just translating a sentence from one language to another. You've got to think about what the words are, what the structures of those words are, what the phrases are, and all of that. And Flex is a great tool for visualizing and storing this kind of stuff. Can you go back to the gloss view, please? See a bit more together. So now, 1-1 one, one and 1-2 one, uh, are existential clauses. There was and there were three. So I'm going to look. I'm hoping that there will be some identifiable verb. And I think, no, I thought I'd seen one earlier. There was a giant, Kole Nana Maka. There were three youths. Beto Kole, no, there it is, Kole Dia. That second word I'm in one, two, I'm gonna compare with the first word in one, one. I think that's gonna be our verb that talks about existence. What do you think, Peter? Hmm. Now, one, three. It doesn't talk about existence. It's uh, describing action. We don't see that cole root. So it smelled good to the giant. What other kind of assumptions does this give you that you see cole twice? Is there any other um, 
conclusions you can start to draw about the grammar of this language by seeing Cole there in those positions in 1-1 one, one, and 1-2? One, well, it seems that it at least allows verbs in the initial position. Romance languages do it in certain marked positions for special occasions. And other languages universally will have the verb first. Now from 1-2, it looks like it's not universal because you have this beto, which might be and. But then for the clause itself, you might have initial verb preference there. We see beto again in 1.4. So we see it and there were three use. And then when they'd been out, they came, there we have it. They came back to cook them over an open fire. It could be an and that is not rendered in English, but it looks like a conjunction the way it's there between the two commas. By in the way, 1.5, 1, 1. we have and in the translation. And so it smelled good. We don't see beto. Okay. Something to, for us to puzzle over. Now, I do see another issue with um, the orthography, okay. and that is the dash. Flex doesn't handle dashes in the baseline well. This is now, it's been a few years since I've used it much. So we're going to have to find some other way to render this. We could just select, we could, it looks like X is not used. We could use X there instead. We want to find some other symbol. I would want to do it with something and not just get completely, completely get rid of it. What do you think, Peter? Well, there's two options. So assuming this is a suffix, one option is to put the two words together. So I'm going to delete the dash in the baseline, and then I go back to the Analyze tab, and we'll look at it. Now they're I would, together. I would not want to do that myself. It could, because we're destroying information. We could select an, an alternate character like X or some Greek letter or anything we want that Flex will treat in the way we want and substitute it instead. I would strongly urge that. We decide that it's nothing or it's just marking a suffix then it's going to be less important but maybe it marks a glottal stop or some other segment some other actual sound so can we go with x yeah let's let's take this back all right so we're going to back to the baseline uh what i was going to show though before we do the x is that if all we right. just delete this and it is a suffix then we when we go there, into yeah. the that's right we go into the morphemes here you can separate them simply with a space. Or if you put, put a in, dash, it makes a dash. it a If you put an equal sign, it makes it an enclitic, right? So um, I admit I have a pretty good idea what this does. And that is the reason that I wanted to say it was a suffix. But let's come at it knowing nothing like I. But if we I knew nothing. Preserve we all be, the preserve faithfully all the information that we encounter and not. If we wanted to be extremely careful, we would do exactly this and preserve the information till we know. Now we see that X is nowhere else in the text. So X is clearly not a character going to be used uh, later for some sound. So yeah. X for now will be our placeholder for the dash. So we've done two substitutions to the writing system as we found it. That's just something we're going to have to do depending on the materials, the, the programs we're working with. As long as we keep track of what we've done, we should be good. So we go back to the gloss tab, and we're so, going to see if we can guess any more words. Right. Having looked at cole in 1-1 one, one, and cole dia in the following, it seems a safe bet that dia is a meaningful part. I would say a suffix. Now, here we're going to want to go to analyze for this business. So we can, by the way, we can start an analysis and revise it later on. You re you'll end up revising your things many, many times, and Flex will follow you at every step. This is so probably one of the, one of the main strengths of Flex, why don't, there are two main reasons why we don't just do this in a Google Doc, which we could do. And one is that Flex will start filling in words and anticipating like it did with Iliganigani, which it now is giving me an, an opportunity to review, right? I it's can click on the screen thing, press check, and it will say that's fine. The second thing it does is it allows you to mass revise. So later I decide that this X is a suffix and they marked it in that case, but not in this case. It's simply inconsistently marked. Then I can go back and find all the X's and delete all the X's. Say I want to analyze this suffix and I think it's one thing. And then later I change my mind. I simply go to lexicon edit. I change what it means. And then it changes the glossing throughout the entire document and the analysis. So whether, whether you use flex or not, this is the kind of thought that you have to put into analyzing a text. So yes. what you can do here is hit space and then dash. Even if you just hit dash, it'll automatically do it, even with no space. I mean, it will also, it also has a way to input prefixes where the dash is. It defaults, I think, to this way. Yeah. 
if so I wanted to it, say, say I wanted to analyze co as a prefix, if I just put a dash, that's right. It'll still do it. So this is common linguistic practice, not just in flex, but you'll use a dash if something is not a complete word by itself, whatever word is. <laughs> Some things will be independent and others not. And so here we have cole. We know that it occurs as a, as a as an independent word from the line above. And here mm -hmm. we have dia added to it. So I would gloss it as either B or capital COP for copula or something. You originally said existential. Do you want right. exist? Let's say exist. So exist is now our gloss. Want to go ahead and analyze this as a verb or- be I do. Cautious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's start seeing what it does when we- I am pro-verb. <laughs> <laughs> I am proverbially marking it a verb. Very nice. So okay. there we have an unaffixed word. Maybe there's further structure within that'll uh, remain to be seen. And then let's go to one, two and look at cole dia. Is the, do you know about the sound values beyond the G and the Q and all that? Yes. Is this so a fricative or a stop? The D will be a pre-nasalized voice stop. So okay. all the voice stops are prenasalized. This is just a guess based on oceanic, but um, well, then the B, D, and Q in this language are right. all prenasalized stops. Q is the velar one. And this is a guess. It doesn't include this information in the book, but I know about how some of the Bible translating went down in Solomon Islands and particularly the history of Bible translation in Fiji, which affected a lot of the Bible translation that happened in other places. And the Bible translation was often the beginning of literacy in many of these language communities, so it had a huge impact. In fact, Flex Fieldwork software, freely available online, was created for Bible translation. So uh, kind of the rules of the road, if you, if you know the landscape, you'll start to guess that this G is a voiced velar fricative, and the yep. Q is the prenasalized voice stop. Let's go to Colendia in one, two. Colendia. It's going to have a, num a numeral somewhere in there. Let's go into that, analyze, to, so it'll make a box around Kole and Dia if you click on it. And let's let it wreck. So go to the Kole part, click right after the, the purple Kole. Yeah, yeah. You can do it that way with the thing, or in the morphemes line. All right, go back to unknown for that. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, that one. Go to unknown. Go up, no, into the box where the where the letters are. After the E, and now hits space. And it's going to, that'll jog it to search for what it does. Uh, okay, I didn't know that trick. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> Very nice. The, we're seeing Dia for the first time. I have a guess. What's your guess about what Dia indicates? Can you tell me your guess first? All right. Mine is that it marks plural, but there's other possibilities plurality of the existor, plural subject. So I have studied a closely related language and so that happens to use a homophonous form. So I have a pretty good idea what it's doing here. And I don't want to spoil the surprise. Let me um, like give another, another guess what it is. Let's just say plurality is part of it. All righty. So take a first swing at it and let's just create a new entry here and say capital PL or plural. One thing that is common practice in linguistics is to use lowercase. Now this is called glossing. You'll see the word gloss there mm -hmm. in those and at the head of each line. That is creating a little word, a short translation for each piece is glossing. So now we're gonna do you lower use lowercase like we did for exist for roots for the central piece of a word and then for all the affixes, prefixes, suffixes, and whatnot, we tend we like to use capitals. So we can tell at a glance what is the core part. We're going to create a new entry, and it's seeing the dash. It's going to say, "Ah, I recognize you want it as a suffix," and let's mark it as PL. And I like to go below affix type, probably inflectional, but it attaches to a verb. I don't know whether it's inflectional, derivational. That's what you'll find there. I would leave all of because I have a good idea where this is going. I would leave all the rest of it blank. All right, we can do that too. Um, then you, so it lets you be agnostic is a really nice thing about flex, really. You yeah. Have, you make up your and mind I, about it. I'm not certain it does the same thing in every language here, but 
what my guess is that it attaches to not just verbs, it attaches to nouns as well. So I'm going to be agnostic until I know. It might just attach to... With 450 languages, you can know a lot about the proto-language and see stuff that happens very differently. Um, as surely we will, if you're familiar with... For example, many people have studied some Polynesian languages, Hawaiian, Samoan, Maori. Uh, they're going to have some guesses, and some of them are going to be right, and some of them are going to be wrong. So we're going to leave this agnostic for now. Um, did you notice that there is the word three in 1.3? I had not noticed that. Fantastic. Three I was brothers. just wanting to look for more shared words. And three is so, in 1.2 as well. Now, sometimes we have to add and take things away in a free translation, but yeah, right. good procedure to look for shared words in the English and then use that to, as, a, as a clue. So I see kue in both yep. of those lines. Ari and kue occur in oh, both man. lines. And it's a problem for us. We have, is it three youths? Three brothers. I think you're puzzling along the same lines as me. Yeah. First, you get three youths, and you get kui komburu, and then you get three brothers, and you get kui tamatazi. See? So it depends on whether the numeral precedes the noun that it's modifying or not. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, again, where the mega polyglots have noticed things that's going to help you with your intuitions. There's this thing called word order typology, pioneered um, by Greenberg. Joseph Greenberg. And though many of the absolute claims were proven false, the trends were pretty accurate. And typically when verbs precede objects in a language, then also numerals will precede the noun. Very nice. Let us add one more thing in the word gloss. Let's go back up to the top one, one, one. For that exist in the blue part, the uh, bottom but one, I want to say it exists in the word gloss line. So the 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 root there, the una, apparently unaffix root will mean exist, but I, here I want to say that it exists. It exists a giant. Yeah, I would. You want then for the colidia, I would want to put they exist. So I think that what they have done is there was a giant. They're mm -hmm. using there as like an empty subject as in there's yes. beer in the fridge what is it? it rains who is it absolutely i believe this is an accommodation of translation and that they're not having any empty subjects in this language though we don't know yet um but what what you can do in flex is you can have a, a gloss for the the piece itself but then another gloss for what it's doing in the sentence yeah so that's what we're doing here we're going to say it exists in word gloss so that we have this right here and again, we can change this later if we decide yep. that there aren't dummy subjects. But for now, we have, it exists a giant. And we don't know what nana or maka means. Yeah, that'll remain to be seen. We see maka again in 1.3. Then under kolindia, let's put they exist. And under beto, we can provisionally put and. Don't know if I want to create an entry for it yet, but my guess, they exist. Well, we've got reason to think that and might not be that way because we've got and down here in 1.5 and no beto, and then we've got there. beto in 1.4 and no and. All right, that's true. Let's let's hold off on that then. But, but the idea try. that it's connecting two pieces of speech is probably pretty spot on. There were three youths. Ari, ka. Ari, below then, kue, ari, ka, kue. Yeah, and ari, kue again. Ari, kue, tamatazi. Fascinating stuff. So when they'd been out, they came back. For this kind of, at this level, I really like to go back to gloss view. We see more meat at here. once. Yeah. And you can just do provisional word glosses. Let's go ahead and identify kue as three, see if that pans out. And then komburu as youth, meaning a young person, not the abstract quality of being young. And let's put Tamatazi in 1-3 as brothers. Brother or brothers. Let's just say brother. Up to you. I'll leave it as brother. Yeah. So for that, for that, the word gloss line is very useful. It might mean brothers in one case and just brother in another. Another brother. So when they'd been out, they came back to cook them over an open fire. Do we have a word that means they? We have Azai in 1-4 and following. No. Yes, we have Azai. 
in both 1.4 and 1.5, we don't have a really good candidate for which word they might be sharing there. Well, this so, actually. We both have so. Some sort of logical sequence being indicated. I admit, I think Beto is so. Okay. So there were three U's. Now, we should say, we shouldn't expect things to match too perfectly between language, especially unrelated ones. English has a single word and, and nothing else does the work of and. But if you know Chinese, you might know that there's a dozen words that do the work of and. And they, they go in different places. Some languages might lack a word that means and. So lots of possibilities there. I think that one of our most fruitful approaches at this point would be to add more data. Yep, let's do it. I'm tending that way too. All right, so I'm gonna go back to our baseline here. Did we complete that par No, the par first paragraph? We're not even done with the first paragraph yet. And already so much has been gleaned. Nika nika ni koza, koza para nga. So after you say really gani gani. What you can do, do you wanna add this? I would say, let's, you can grab it from the PDF potentially, put it in the Google doc and then from then correct any mistakes. Let's try it this way. Anyway. So I'm gonna see if I can add a little bit more there from the- Try grabbing it. There's gonna be mistakes. Do this too, before you put it in the doc, copy it, then go to the URL window up top. That'll get rid of formatting weirdness. Yeah, even in the same, whatever. Just paste it there and then re-grab it from there. Very clever trick, Tyler. Uh, it's saved me a lot of time i think over the years okay so we have it pretty good uh, we just need to that's good that, that destroys some information so you need to look over it carefully in the third word paranga it's an underlined n we're going to put in our glottal stop what's that paranga we're going to mm -hmm. do a nasal not a glottal stop thank you yeah yeah feeler nasal my goodness what an embarrassing error paranga? Uh oh <laughs> that's the one omanga same thing kae Naza zomanga. So that omanga occurs twice. Everything so all right? Paranga here. And then we got omanga. Zda and zomanga. And let's get rid of that space between. Ah, uh, no, they have a space there. Whatever. It's probably not too essential, but it's good to take note of those things. Now, pange in the next sentence, beala pange as a as a feeler. Nari mana nyango. Tutia ko mana tikua na nge. That's going to be nge. All right. Yep. Pretty good. So let's put them, let's do a hard return at the na. Yeah, whatever. Thank you. Well, I'll do it after we put it in the baseline. Okay. It's all one paragraph, and we're going to keep that. This is our first paragraph in flex. So we're going to open flex back up. See, where does this leave us? We look at our glossing tab. Where does this leave us? Do we have any new and useful information? Once we identify omanga, that occurs multiple times. So we've got omanga coming multiple times. Let's add in our. Ah, yes. Would you look okay. at the translation for me? For it I should be, be this to... first one after, and it smelled so good. And so it smelled good. Yeah. So he said, hmm, hmm, that smell. Gosh, that smell, that smell, exclamation. Gosh, that smell, exclamation. I think that's that line. So I said, mm -hmm, that smell, gosh, that smell, and that's it? Uh, no, he continues speaking. That is my kind of food today. I think that's gonna be one seven, but here you see a difficulty that presents itself. I think omanga is gonna be smell, so it's mentioned twice there. And one seven doesn't have omanga, and it goes, that is my kind of food today. And one point so it's not the end of the quote. The quote continues, Peter. Yeah, I know. You I can see it goes down to gengu. So let's at the end of one six in the free translation, you have an end quote, but we shouldn't have one. That is my kind of food today. Food today. All right, so I think this might be. Let's not, Peter. Free translation one six, get rid of the end quote. 
This is important for keeping track of the flow of the narrative where the quote, what I like to do is an old convention with the, if the quote continues, put one at the beginning of one seven, which it does. It does in the real. Free translate, no, no, free translation. Free translation is, okay, that's what got me, okay. Our line. Free translation line one seven, no, free, the one headed free. There, the quote is continuing. I would mark it the, just to keep real good track. And then in one eight, it's gonna continue. I'll follow and find it and eat some, end quote. I'll follow and find it and eat some, end quote. So at the beginning of that line, can you also have the quote resuming, continue quote. All right, so we do have a guest now on Omanga. Where's our first occurrence of Omanga? I believe it is 1.6. 1 1.6, 1 it says, so oh no, one, one, look, one five, we have Omanga, and so it no. smelled good to the giant. Good to the giant. So we're going to say smell is Omanga. What do you think? I do, and it's really interesting that smelt in five, one five is a verb in English, and in one six, that smell is a noun, but it's the same word. Further interesting, both of them have za Omanga. Wow. So that, that feels like an article or some kind of something that introduces a noun to me intuitively. Um, what do you, some kind of case marking? It certainly looks like an article, but it could be a kind of a subject or object agreement or something like that too. It could be yeah, a in, marking aspect. It could be an article. Literally, we don't even know if it's a noun or a verb yet. So you see, dear, dear viewer, a lot of guesswork here. We both, Peter and I have both studied other languages, so we don't, no, we're not totally blank slates, but you see how much we don't know and how much is just guesswork. And that's the situation you're gonna face. That's what makes this the lava level challenge. If you study, if you go and study Russian or something, there's lots and lots of dictionaries and grammars you can consult. Here, all we're working from, there may be other materials, but all we're working from is a bilingual text. So all the grammar remains for us to be discovered at this, from where we're working. I'm not saying nobody else knows this, but we're working blind here. I believe but, someone has written a master's thesis or an article or something of, about certain aspect of this, but I haven't uh, read it. I don't know what it says. <laughs> I just uh, try to have some breadth of the literature. And I have studied a pretty closely, not super closely related language, but a somewhat closely related language. Um, and it gives me a guess on two or three words here, but. That's about it. It's not as helpful as you might think. Um, I think that if you were guessing Spanish from Portuguese, you'd go a lot farther than I am guessing with this language. The language I studied was Roviana, which is another language in Solomon Islands. Um, and it certainly gives me some guesses, but mm -hmm. not to that level. So we get mana nyango and mana tequa. And this is also the first instance of first person. Now, I oh, don't can you can you show me? Can you just click the boxes where those are? Mana nyango mana and mana tequa and uh, I will follow. Okay, okay. Yeah, I will follow and find it and eat some. Okay, that looks fun. Now this na occurs several places. One seven. And yes. then the end of one eight. Oh, same. Oh, look, we have Rengu and then Ngehu, which are anagrams, similar looking ones. <laughs> An error? There could be. Oh, look, it is. Na Ngehu. They both should be Ngengu because the way the script was written, the. Ngehu. That's like right. You see oh. the potential for errors being introduced. Should be Q. First. Always be on your toes. Yeah, yeah. Q first. So I'm going to fix it in both of these. In fact, let's, yeah. And then we'll fix it in the Google Doc. Yep. Got to be on your toes, dear aspiring linguists, for this kind of stuff. Can't I mean, just it was look pretty, at it one pretty good how much the uh, mm -hmm. OCR or whatever recognized from the PDF. For sure. But yeah, we've got to definitely be on our toes. So this uh, is basically how far we can get going through a single paragraph and just basing it on words. 
we got kind of a lot of words. We got one, two. No, we haven't added them all to our dictionary yet. So that might be if we want That's them to thing. add. Yeah, however you want to do it. There's lots of, let's create new entry. Do we want to add, have numeral as a category? We'll be, but, but we can leave it blank. Let's go ahead and I'm just going to show how to add numeral. So what you do is in category, uh, yeah. you go down to the more, more. section. Um, and then you'll see some things already grayed out. That's things it thinks we've already looked at enough. Now there we have determiners, nouns, particles. Um, look in determiners. We see that there's article and quantifier. I think this is one of the most opaque parts of flex if you aren't a syntactician. Yeah, you just got to look through it. Why would you think quantifier is a determiner? I just do. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. So I immediately detect determiner. And here we have inside yeah. of determiner, you get quantifier. Inside of quantifier, you get a folder called numeral. Inside of numeral, you get cardinal number, distributive number, multiplicative right. number, ordinal number. Let's, Let's go with cardinal number. You want to? Okay, I would just go with numeral for now. I'm going to go with numeral for now. We can, can always revise it later. You say add, and that adds it to your drop down menu. Yeah. And so now we've got created for this one. Number. So we're going to, for youth, we're going to create new entry. All we're going to do is say it's a noun. And if it's not a noun, we'll change yep. our mind later. Revise it later. Um, for Dia, we're, le we're going to leave kind of a bit on that. For Tamatazi, then. We're going to create new entry. It's going to suggest to us what we've already word glossed. I'm going to call it a noun again, just based on the position after the numeral. So that's the syntactician in me. For mm -hmm. smell, well, this is different. I literally have no clue. I have no inkling. Is this a noun yep. or a verb yet? Could so be I'm both. Yeah. Not sure. And that wraps up most of the ones we've solved. So when you go through you've the analyze tab, you can see there's some green boxes where we can improve. Is this the same word or is this a homophone and we need to create a new entry? That's what it's telling us. I go over to lexicon now and I look in my lexicon. We've got, you know, one entry, not really analyzed at all, India, that we don't know what it does. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. We've already got seven words. Let's go. You... Let's try to pin down what that Ngehu is. The one that occurs twice, the one we corrected. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. That is my kind of food today. I will follow and find it and eat some. I think that's going to be the food word. The food isn't mentioned in the English for one eight, but eat some means eat some food. So interesting that it's the first word or the first phrase in one seven apparently, and the last phrase in one eight. In one eight, it's in one seven, it's a subject. That is my food. Well, it's not an object. And in one eight, it's an object. Well, is the thing being eaten? It does look that way. Let's call it food now tentatively. Okay. okay. Um. Mana, mana. Mana could be I. It's could twice be. One eight. Could be. Do we have any other I's in the English? I don't think so. No, we don't. Um. And as far as food goes, here I will follow and find it and eat some. Um, one of the things that's going on is we're expecting kind of three different verb phrases there. Yeah, so, something. Three clauses. But we don't really see kind of we're I guess we're starting to see there's this na and za and they both get mm -hmm. they're both available for contraction where's our na contraction right we had one with n oh it's maybe in a following paragraph in any case we know that n and z can do it za is going before stuff and na is going before stuff here it is na iliganigani we have another typological issue one six that tick that it's using or the apostrophe after naza z, it's not going to recognize. It's not going to let us do anything with. So let's replace that with another sign. There is a more script-like apostrophe you can get that that flex will accommodate. I've dealt with this before, as you might have guessed here. So we just need to replace it with some other. Yeah, try that. 
What we want is for it to be graspable by flex, that Z apostrophe is a unit. So if you go back to gloss, did that, oh, did that improve anything? One six, it did not. We need another character. So if you just go back to your Google, I don't know, look for a script apostrophe or something like that, apostrophe character. Couldn't we just use something different than X? We can, we can use some other thing too, that's fine. But there's apostrophes that are useful, I think, if I recall correctly. What do you, what do you feel like using? Well, I'm ready to take a gamble and say that it's a contraction. Yeah. And so what I think is that we should um, delete the space, enter it as Zomanga. I'm reluctant to that because we're, we're destroying information that way. And I want to advise beginners, people just getting into this kind of work, never to do that kind of thing. How about exclamation point? That's going to end the sentence, or it's going to end the line. So that's not too soon. That try a pipe, maybe. Do you know the character I mean? The one's just a vertical line. Yeah, I got it in there. Get rid of this pipe. Works. I think it might also break it. Yeah, it's not going to work either. Same problem. All right, I have a cat that wants to be let in. Pardon me for a moment. All right. Well, I'll clean up our data in the meantime. Very good. Very good. Let me mute. All right. And so for Z. In order to preserve the information, um, I need to select a character that never occurs in the text. And X has already been used. So they have an R in the language. They have an L in the language. They have both liquids. Looks like they have uh, a lot of the normal characters. I don't see a W, right? So just while the cat is away, the mice will play. I could put these two together and then I could train Flex to recognize that it's a contraction and give me the option every time, if we were sure it was a contraction. And I'll show you how to do that after we're more sure that it's a contraction. For now, I'm going to use the character F because F does nothing. Uh, it's not used anywhere as far as we can tell. So um, when we go to the gloss tab, we'll have ZF that way. And we'll probably eventually have to create ZF as a variant of ZA when we know what ZA is and what ZA does. So we're again kind of stuck. We don't really have enough data. So one of the best things for us to do is to go back to that same well. We're going to go ahead and enter in a little more data, try to figure out a little more data. I decided so to use F for now since it doesn't occur in the data. That'll work. Um, and a lot or of the apostrophe stuff just wasn't working well. You might also try C if that's not used. It looks more apostrophe-like. You could also use a capital letter. It's real clear. I'm gonna use C. I like that suggestion. <laughs> Seems more empty and neutral feeling and than an F. It stands for contraction, so it's good. We yeah. like it. Okay, let's enter in a little bit more of our data. And let's check carefully, make sure we don't get any switcheroos. So we know this is one paragraph. Oh, try put it, pasting it in the URL window first. Or I guess you could paste with it. Clear formatting is also good, but that's just a cheap way to do it. And then Control A, Control X. Yeah. Okay. Now let's take a look and see what what little errors we have. So Gazavoto, Niliganigani, Korapa, Paroparago. Looks good. Arikue Kamuria. See, there we have an extra ah uh, there. That's a little thing we can wow. fix. Not had that happen before. That does pretty well. Hmm. Nazara Paruia. All right, so this Parogo and Paro Parogo probably connected. Parogia. Yeah, Paro yeah, yeah. Dig it. Zahua. My Peki. Vaniziu Tangu. We have seen Ia before already, haven't we? Yes. Go uh, in the second line of that new paragraph after na karusuna. Second line of that, about the middle, na karusuna. Then it should be a. Uh, oh, I just lost karusuna. Karusuna, comma, end quote. Zangua, period. After 
maybe it is one, that should be comma, end quote. It's, uh, it's got a dot. It should be comma, end quote there. Comma, end quote, Zagwa. Karusu Ngeruni. Oh, no, that was it, that was at a different place. Mm, pretty sure it's that. My tangu, I'm going through word for word. Rani tu. Karuvia Zagwa. Interesting, there is V now. Rani tu Koena. Tumusuna. Rani tu Tumuzuna. Tumusuna Tumuzuna is nice. That gang now we have Gengu with a knee at the end. Gengu ni, yes, wonderful. Okay, I'm excited to look at this new paragraph. My tangu livona, gani tu livona. Let's make sure we don't have any more mistakes. There's that na contracted, the giant or something like that. Yeah. So one of the things my oceanic sense is about na is that in a lot of languages, Na will do multiple things. One of the things I bet it's doing is some sort of article, <laughs> because we're seeing it proceed, proceed giant like that, but it's going to be hard to know for sure, because, well, yep. there's obvious well, reasons why Na would be a likely homophone, because it's coronal, it's simple, yeah, yeah. Right. it's going to be... We have yeah. no as a homophone in English, like the negation and yep. the yep. knowledge verb Two. two extremely oh. common things, yet they're homophones. Three words pronounced two, which are high frequency. All right, and I'm going to put this in the baseline now. Now that we think it's looking okay. And in this, in, since we're putting it in the baseline, I'll make it its own new paragraph now. New paragraph. So we, we, gave, we gave it as good of a look we could for. Yep. We can still add the free translation. So that's going to be number two. It recognizes giant. Okay, let's put it, yeah, let's put it in the freeze. Free, right. can you say briefly what, what is meant by free translation for those who never heard the term? Uh, free translation is a translation that makes sense in another language. <laughs> so, for example, we've seen that and and so aren't lining up exactly. Well, transition words and connective words might do different things in languages, but I need to put it in a way that makes sense in the language. So free translation means this is a translation of the sentence that will make sense in English. That'll be sufficient. Yeah, no, right. If you know Spanish, you can drop the subject a lot in Spanish, but you can in English. So in a free translation, you'd need to have the correct subject pronoun always. So what's All our right. first one starting with Gaza Voto? Gaza Voto. The giant jumped out of the forest while the three were still grilling a crab. While the three were still grilling a crab over an open fire. So now we got fire again. Grilling a crab over an open fire. Dot. Now I don't, I don't know yet what the verb is or whatever, but I do know that um, grilling over an open fire might be one one word. Yep. In a in a in a culture where that's an important thing, it's going to have its own word. So since you have the hmm there in at the end of two one, let's open quote hmm. What are you cooking? What are you cooking? Now the quote continues, so don't close it. What are you cooking question? Next line. Whenever Flex sees a question mark, it's it's gonna put you on a new line. Yeah. Here, quote continues, if you'll open. Open quote. So we okay. can keep track that it's spoken. I gotcha. What are you cooking? Question and end quote. And then the next line lit. What are you cooking? It's repeated. Naza Ramu Parugia. That's really helpful to see it repeated like that. And, and then two, three is, he said. Two, four will be, open quote, give me a little bit. Nice, two words, give me a little bit. Yeah, so you can see it's not lining up one for one. And then the quote continues, two, five, open, give me a leg. Give me a so leg. that Zahua is repeated. It's not in the English. Yeah. He said, what I like to do if I'm adding to what I found is I'm going to put square brackets around. He said, uh, I spoiled it. by I already, I revealed my hypothesis on Zagua as he said, Zahua. <laughs> based on this 2.3, we have a yep. pretty good guess. And the question is, is the subject included? Is the Zah some sort of. How beautiful. Agreement. 
or a zagwa of just a verb meaning he said and the subject's been dropped. So we don't know. 2.6 will be? He ate the leg. <laughs> this is great. He ate the leg. Okay, next line. Quote, give me the big claw. Full stop, end quote. Give me the big claw. Uh, he ate the big claw. So real helpful stuff. So we immediately- This is what we want. Mm -hmm. Or start seeing some patterns here, have some guesses. I love nalivona tulivona. Now you, you have a good idea what give yep, yep. and ate and the object is, so. Quote, give me the shell, end quote. He ate the shell. Okay, so not na koena. My tangu koena, without an article or whatever that is, he ate the shell. Uh, actually, full sentence, it's two separate sentences. No, 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 you had it right. That one was right before. Claw, period. I'd like to be as faithful as I can. Give so me the big claw, period. Is it, sentence, he ate the claw. So my baseline is wrong? No, 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 baseline is good. Oh, that's English three translations. Diverse, okay, yeah, can you give it a capital H in two seven? I originally had it that way, but I you just did. Yes. thought I was fixing things. Same Give in the point eight. Same, same formatting there in the English. Same style. He ate the shell. It makes like, <laughs> because eating is not a verb of speaking, it makes probably better sense in English as a separate sentence. Give me the body. All right, now. Period, he ate the body. Now we do have an interesting thing here in that we've got Tumusuna and Tumuzuna. Let's check and see if those are really different or if that was a, nope, they are different. <laughs> it, could, it could certainly be an error in our original, or this might be a real subtle case marking sort of distinction. I believe it's a typographical, uh, does it make any difference? We're gonna treat it as an orthographic variant here. <laughs> For right. now, we're gonna to have to treat it as Tumuzuna as a variant of Tumusuna. Um, if you know Japanese, especially old Japanese, you'll see that kind of fluctuation. It's not unheard of. Now, su and za, for those who don't know phonetics, those have involved the identical place of articulation. The only difference is whether it's voiced or not. Z is voiced, s is voiceless. Inside the mouth, the very same stuff going on. They're related sounds. Well, let me ask you, but, Tyler, am I going crazy? Or in the original text, is there is that the only S in the entire text? I uh, know there's others. Okay, stop where you are. In the upper paragraph, do you see the line beginning with koi? Okay, not the last line, the other koi. There we have batia na suvege, suvege. Other, other S's are there. Suvege, suvu, suvu, They might be in free variations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could be something really subtle and cool going on. Let's identify a few more words and then I got to get going, unfortunately. Without knowing uh, what it is, my suspicion is that they collapse intervocalically. The distinction collapses. Neutralization. Uh, hypothesis, we can prove it wrong soon. Yep, yep, yep. It's good to set up guesses and prove them either right or wrong as time. All right, so now we've got some more words. We specifically got... Do we got parogo anywhere up here? We do. Paro, oh, parogo, maybe not parogia in 2 1. But paro is going to be that. Before we've got paro parogo. Open fire. Okay. I think so cook them over an open fire is paro parogo. I believe so too. Or parogo. And paro parogo is a reduplication of parogo. I believe so too. A go looks like a suffix to me. Yeah, another suffix. In 2 1, they're, 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 they're together. The giant jumped out of the forest while the three were still grilling. We have the three, kue. So it's got that right. And kamu. Kamuya. Hmm, what are you cooking? So paroguia, something about you cooking. So this Paro. kamu is interesting because we've got a you right there, right? What's interesting about that, Preto? Oh, that can't be right. There you have Gamu right there and Kamu. I hope that this KG thing isn't what's going on with S and Z. <laughs> it could be. Could be a different alternation. They do look related. Because there that you go. What are you cooking? If you know any Celtic languages, this will seem familiar. So 
We've got Naza a couple times. Naza, hmm. Naza gamu parogia. What are you cooking? And again, what are you cooking? So we've decided parogo or something is cook. I think paro. But there's, yeah, there's multiple possibilities. It's not straightforward at all. Don't want to. I posit that the root is paro. And then you can add, you reduplicate that, add a suffix ro in that word that you have highlighted. So let's translate it as grilling, open, either grilling or open fire. Whew. You can call it grilling for now and know, know okay. what we mean. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's the Roasting benefit of or something. Let's keep grilling here. The adi might be a while part. Or korapa could be while. Well, look, we've got adi here with the three. Adi ku, okay. Adi here with the three. Or adi kakue with the three. Is it a... Is it a warning to the listener that a numeral's coming up? It's going to be a two part. I do have program. a hypothesis. What is yours? Uh, it's an article to indicate plural nouns. Very nice. It's the plural article. That's why I was hesitant to commit too much to plural for India, is that I suspected there would be a plural article later. Okay. Article. It doesn't attach. Yeah, something that just precedes noun phrases. Come over here. Um, Wonderful stuff. Um, but Kamuria, well, Naza. What? Yeah, I. What? Okay. Kamuparoia. It's repeated. Zagua. Zagua. Uh, Zagua. I'm giving away my, my guesses here. It could be Zagua. Why would I know that it's Zagua? I have no idea. That Raza Votu in line one seems like a contraction. Oh, in line 2.1. 2.1, yeah. Yes, I think that's probably accurate. Oh, let's go to the baseline for that line and replace the apostrophe with a C. As we've been doing. Yeah, so let's take a quick look. Do we have any more apostrophes hanging out? Should be good for now. Do Maybe a space. space? Let's, let's do it with a space, yeah. Okay, let's get some of the low-hanging fruit and leave some of the tough stuff for next time. Oh, so, you know what? Real cool thing. Let's go back up to where we just were with that apostrophe. Click on the NC and hit oh, that one, and now hit the chain icon to the right. It's going to link them together the way they were. See that? Link. Yeah. That's going to tell Flex we're regarding this as, in some sense, a unit or a phrase, a single. And if we change our mind, you can That's see right. the Unlink. Link. Okay, low-hanging fruit. All right, I so go ahead and identify that plural article. If that's what it is, looks good for now. I'm gonna put it as PL for now, and then we'll analyze it as an article later. Now, what's the real low hanging fruit, of course, is yeah, yeah, claw, Livona. shell, body. That's right, claw. We, we can call it big claw. It's probably yep. a yeah, now. The asymmetrically clawed crabs, is that what's going I'd on? I'd like you to notice something kind of conspicuous here before we do our analysis. All of these end in na. Livona, koena, tumusuna. They all end in na. That could Up be here, definite. Give me a leg. Yeah, yeah. Karusuna. That's great. For this, maybe let's go to the analyze tab. Well, right here we can do karusu. As legs. That's, yeah. And then we have a guess that the na is a suffix in all the other ones. What do you think? That's great. Or an enclitic. Yeah. Yeah. I it's, mean, we don't know what it, it's something that's right. attaching. It's a, it's a morpheme. Yeah. It's a, it's a, let's go to our analyze it. tab. Now we've identified it for Karusu. So we there go we to go. Karusu na. Let's give it a space, dash. dash. So let's once we, we can create the entry either place. But that's going to be the word like, yeah, yeah. Does it, Let's I mean, call that a noun. Yeah, we'll call it a noun for now. And then this one, we'll- You can use the, remember, can use the, yeah. Remember, you can use the space too. Just give it a little nudge and it'll look for it. A leg. Okay, so it's not that it's definite necessarily because a crab is going to have many legs, but it's mm -hmm. something that is not part of the noun itself. 
what the na means right so yeah we've got yep. a na coming right before it too. yep, yep. <laughs> What does that remind me? I've seen a language that does that sort of article on either side of the thing, but I can't recall which it is. Yep. So the claw is probably just the levo part. I'm going to call it big claw because I would guess that in a culture here, that lives. Before, wait, wait. Before you create it, put a dot between big and claw, if you would. Yeah. So we know that's a single piece. Eight. And then in the word that. gloss there, if you'll get rid of that dot, <laughs> I put it in the one place so I can get rid of it elsewhere. We have a nicer look, yeah. Rani tu. Rani tu. What do you think about the Rani followed by tu? Is it really two words? Tu could be uh, an enclit uh, some kind of clitic. Well, here we get um my tangu na gani tu my gani. tangu with no na and then gani tu gani my tu. tangu and then gani tu so there's some sort of like give me the he ate the type thing going on so we sure know gani means eat yeah we saw kani also so this did we see kani i remember talking remember we talked about kai I told you it was my guess from Ili Gani Gani, and Gani is reduplication of the word eat. Was that it? Okay, you mentioned Gani. Okay, yeah. okay. So I did guess Gani would be eat as well, because I already knew the proto oceanic word for eat, which was Kani. I've lost our spot here. But no, I, did, I don't know for sure. All right, I'm going to go ahead and gloss this as eat. So that giant word, we're thinking it could be a word like a, a, a massive eater or something like that. Yeah. I, I I mean I don't know what what it, ili gani gani means, but in my imagination right now, it mm -hmm. probably means something like thing that eats anything, based on the fact yep. he ate the claw and the shell. <laughs> <laughs> True, yeah, too tasty. Uh, must be he eats anything, All right? So I think this might be kind of it for how much time we have to work on this today. Unfortunately, but I look forward to working on it some more. Yeah, and I hope that uh, our viewers are enjoying this and it challenges them to go study a language they don't know about. And I happen to have this access to this text in Ganonga, but there are many ways to get access to exactly this sort of project. Um, I, I hope that you enjoy it as we continue to learn more about Ganonga. Yep.